The views expressed on the Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliate radio stations airing the show. Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP at 103.3 FM in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions, comments, or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Also, if you're interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of the show, you're free to do so. Just send us an email if you end up using any content. If you care to, you can send us letters at our new address, which is The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. This week we share some more perspectives on prison stretching back decades. You're about to hear the second half of our conversation from earlier this year with Ray Luke Levasseur. Mr. Levasseur is a longtime activist, Vietnam vet, revolutionary, and former political prisoner in the U.S. Ray was a reputed founder of the Sam Melville slash Jonathan Jackson unit, later known as the United Freedom Front, which conducted sabotage, expropriations, and attacks against profiteers and symbols of American imperialism and oppression abroad. After nine years of activity in the group and living underground, members of the group were apprehended and became known as the Ohio Seven. Ray was paroled in 2004, about 20 years after his arrest. We aired the first part of my conversation with Ray back in March, where he talked about his time underground, his relationship with Tom Manning, and the resistance Tom has been giving, and the repression that Tom has faced as an aging prisoner in the federal system for the death of a cop he claims to be innocent of. In this hour, Ray talks about his introduction into political organizing in 1968 after returning from the Vietnam War. Ray joined an anti-racist, anti-Vietnam War and pro-labor organization called Southern Student Organizing Committee in Clarksville, Tennessee. He was incarcerated in 1969 for a drug charge. He was selling weed to supplement his GI Bill and repressed as an anti-racist prisoner and organizer. And he began to put the pieces together about criminalization, capitalism, and white supremacy. Ray then talks about his time at Brushy Mountain, where convict lease, or the transition period of forced labor after slavery, prisoners had been forced to mine coal, and where Ray was held in death row. He later talks about the activities of the Marxist guerrilla group, the Sam Melville Jonathan Jackson Unit, from 1975 to 1978, and then from 1982 to 1984, the United Freedom Front began bombing and bank robbing activities for which members were convicted and served time in prison. Again, with Tom Manning and Jan Lahman still inside currently. Ray then responds to our question about his view as a long-term anti-racist organizer about the resurgence of street-level fascist and racist organizing in recent history in the U.S. and informs us about engaging as an anti-racist in support of indigenous Penobscot Nation resistance to the Penobscot River being commercialized in Maine. We apologize for the quality of the audio in this interview. We were having technical difficulties with our new audio setup when this was recorded. Here are a few announcements. The August 21st to September 9th prison strike is in full bloom with participation around the U.S. among immigrant detainees, folks in county, state, and federal facilities, as well as prisoners in Halifax, Nova Scotia, putting on a solidarity statement. Rather than list out all these inside and outside sol- like actions, again, we'll point you all to prisonstrike.com, where you'll find links to IWOC, IGD, Jailhouse Lawyers Speak, Sawari Me, and other resources and clearinghouses where the press releases, images, posters, interviews, updates, and call-outs are being collected. Tools for you to use to amplify and spread the prison strike. And check out this audio postcard that somebody produced for the ears of prisoners. We're also linking that in our notes. Also, if you're looking things to listen to, you can check out recent and upcoming episodes of the IGD cast, Kite Line, Rust Belt Abolition Radio, 
the newly added from embers and recently restarted crime think hotwire all members of the channel zero network of anarchist podcasts and here's a jingle from a member of czn yeah 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 this is M1, M-A Uno, M-A De La Gente, comprending, intending, you feel me? I'm one half of dead prayers, to tell it like it is, everything is political, rap duo. Here holding my middle finger up to imperialism worldwide. And you in tune right now to the rebel beat. The Rebel Beat is a monthly podcast of radical political music across different genres and across different continents. It's the mixtape to a riot against police brutality. It's your nightly newscast set to bass and beats. It's protest anthems from Hong Kong to Istanbul to Ferguson to Montreal. Give it a listen at rebelbeatradio.com or subscribe today on all your favorite podcast platforms. Last Monday, August 20th, the Silent Sam statue of Confederate soldiers from UNC Chapel Hill was removed by anti-racist students and community members, and now neo-Confederate goons are rattled. Saturday, August 25th, there was a rally with racists waving stars and bars in Chapel Hill and scuffling with anti-racists. A number of anti-racists were arrested and released at the Monday event, and then three warrants were set for people in the triangle and more arrests occurred at the rally on Saturday. When fundraising sites are up, we'll be sure to pass that information on. In response to the monument coming down, one in a line of monuments in New Orleans, Memphis, Charlottesville, Richmond, and even little old Asheville being contended with, neo-Confederates are up in arms. There's a call up for a counter to the League of the South demo in Elizabethton, Tennessee on September 29th. More info on how to resist the losers can be found in the future episodes of this show. And here are a few announcements that we stole from Crying Thanks, the latest hot wire. Anarchist prisoner Sean Swain is still being held in solitary. You can call director Gary Moore at 614-387-0588 or email drc.publicinfo at odrc dot state dot oh dot us or melissa adkins at odrc dot state dot oh dot us that's the administrative assistant to more you can also use this script if you like quote i'm calling on behalf of sean swain inmate number 243-205 i am a friend of sean i am calling to request the odrc grant mr swain's appeal regarding his most recent disciplinary record drop the charges and lower his security level from 5B to 2. Mr. Swain is not a physical security risk, and there is no reason to keep him at such a high security rating where he will be unable to get the programming he needs to be eligible for rehabilitation and parole. Thank you for your consideration. Unquote. Also of note, we are sorry to share with you that alleged Earth Liberation Front activist Joseph Dibby was captured by the Cuban state and handed over to the FBI. Joseph is being charged with arson and conspiracy charges related to ELF actions taken almost 20 years ago. In the show notes, we'll be linking to a Crime Think article about his case. You can send him letters of care and encouragement, hopefully not including anything about his case or anything illegal as he's in pretrial, by writing him at... Joseph Dibby, D-I-B-E-E, -E, number 812-133, Multnomah County Detention Center, 11540, Northeast Inverness Drive, Portland, Oregon, 97220. Finally, Anarchists in Zurich, Switzerland, will be hosting a tattoo circus there from August 31st to September 2nd to raise money for political prisoners and the Anarchist Black Cross. And you can find out more about that event in Zurich, Switzerland at tattoocircuszurich.noblogs.org. We're speaking with Ray Luke Levasseur. 
a uh, longtime activist, Vietnam vet, revolutionary, and former political prisoner in the U.S. Ray was a reputed founder of the Sam Melville and Jonathan Jackson unit, later known as the United Freedom Front, which conducted sabotage, expropriations, and attacks against profiteers and symbols of American imperialism and oppression abroad. After nine years of activity in the group and living underground, members of the group were apprehended and later became known as the Ohio Seven. Ray was paroled in 2004, about 20 years after his arrest. Ray, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Thanks for having me. Would you be willing to share how you became actively involved in politics and what that looked like? Well, that goes back to, uh, I I first became politically active in 1968 in Tennessee. But the, uh, the background to that is that during my 21 years of life up until that point, I had never been politically active in in anything. I had no political awareness, no political perspective. Before I went into the uh, Army and military service, I pretty much only read the sports page on the newspaper. And I didn't come from a family that was politically active, not even in a conventional sense. So, as I said, I ended up in the U.S. Army, and in 1967, I served during Vietnam, and that was really the first life experience, first crossroads in my life. Um, so, you know, a confluence of war and the military, uh, racism and the environmental destruction, so that just melded together for me in that in that experience. And I began to think for the first time about, seriously, about, you know, the issues underlying the war, the reasons that were promoted to perpetuate it. I began to call it into question. I turned vehemently against the war. Um, and when I came back stateside, I was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, to finish my hitch which is just a few miles from the Tennessee state line. So by now, uh, I am very, I had a lot of gut level feelings about the political system. You know, growing up in in an ethnic minority, the French Canadians uh, in Milltown, Maine, and um, seeing, you know, the level of exploitation and workers and having experienced it myself and having seen it in my family. And, um, you know, I had a gut level feeling something was wrong, but it was, it was the war that coalesced it up to that, you know, at, at that point. So we're, in 1968, when I left the service, I decided to remain in the South. And I lived in Clarksville, Tennessee, about 45 miles from Nashville. And I enrolled in Austin Peay State University. The first time I had been in, uh, you know, in the educational setting beyond high school, and I I was looking for a vehicle to become politically active. The war was foremost on my mind. Um, Not many months before I got out, one of my closest friends was killed over there. But the war was was really predominantly on the, on my mind, and other things, there was sort of a current of other things running through it, and when I was exposed to the organization I became politically active with for the first time, it's called the Southern Student Organizing Committee, which was known by its acronym SOC, which was a southern regional-based group. It, it had chapters in all the southern states. I was attracted to the group because it it was an overwhelmingly white membership group, uh, but it had an emphasis on the responsibility of whites to do anti-race, anti-racist work. Uh, and, and beyond that, it, it, its platform was opposed to the Vietnam War and in support of... Uh, the civil rights movement that was in, you know, this is 1968 in, into 69, supporting various facets of the civil rights movement, 
And significantly, they were very involved in also in supporting um, labor struggles. And you know, I grew up totally in a community that, like, 90% of whom worked in mills and shoe factories. So I had, I had, um, you know, that that appeal, that 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 their outlook on things appealed to me at that time, and this is and so there was no existing chapter of SOC in Clarksville, Tennessee. There was a, a good sized one in Nashville. So I looked up hooked up with organizers in Nashville, and we started a chapter myself and others in Clarksville from from scratch, essentially. And one of the first projects I got involved with was not, you know, directly related to the war or or to civil rights, per se, but it was a labor struggle. And, but it overlapped with anti-racist work because the labor struggle involved uh, meat packing plant uh, in Clarksville, Tennessee, where uh, a union of black and white workers had struck over conditions, in particular, in wages. And conditions at that time in those meat packing plants were pretty, pretty horrendous. And if I remember, it was the Newhoff uh, meat packing plant, and they had plants throughout the South, and they were being struck across the South. So, um, and also got my first exposure to, like, organized sabotage, because some of the meat shipments that were produced by scabs were um, sabotaged at that time. So, so my, my first step into activism was through the Southern Student Organizing Committee, and in particular, I got in and did some support work around this meat package strike, and but and then from there got involved in some some anti-war work as well. And pretty soon, you found yourself involved in organizing in prison, right, and around incarceration in the South. Could you talk about that a little bit? I can. Just like, you know, I mean, one of the things I liked about Southern Student Organizing Committee was that it it connected the dots. It connected the war to to imperialism. It connected war to white supremacy. It connected war and and a labor struggle. And, um, but I hadn't quite made the connection to prisons yet. And... The way I became involved in prison organizing, uh, prison work, was sort of the same way I got involved in anti-war work. It took a war, direct participation in the war as an American soldier, before I began to see the light. And it took (laughs) direct participation in the jail, prison system, the American gulag, for me to appreciate the need for and the role of prison organizing. And what happened was in 1969, when I was with the Southern Student Organizing Committee, I made a mistake no organizer then or in 2018 should ever make, which is to mix illegal drugs and community political work. But this is 1969, everybody's smoking a lot of weed, we smoked in Vietnam, I didn't have enough money from the GI Bill, I needed a little supplement, so I made the stupid error of selling a little weed on the side. But I was already on the police radar screen because of my very visible role as a student organizing committee. I mean, we, we, we were already seeing ourselves under surveillance. And in a small city like Clarksville, we suddenly stood out as we passed our literature around and everything. So the short of it is that I was busted for selling $7 worth of marijuana on one count, $50 worth 
on another count. And jailed. And it's amazing now because we have legal recreational marijuana in Maine, and we had medical marijuana. Uh, marijuana is already um, was already legal before that. So I'm I I go downtown around here where you know it's totally legal now. So I'm looking at things that are legal for which we were, you know, so many of us were persecuted over in the past. It's quite amazing, but. Anyways, the minute I stepped through that jailhouse door was that second big life experience. That was my second big life experience after the Vietnam War, being directly dropped into the middle of that. Now I'm being dropped into the middle, in the middle of the American Gulag, the Tennessee State Prison System in particular. And so back in that those days, you you remained in a county jail until your case was resolved, usually after the direct appeal. And if you were if you were sentenced to over a year, then you were headed to the state penitentiary. Well, the conditions in the the county jail were absolutely awful. They were starving us in that place. And prisons were getting sick. And the prison population, the, uh, the county jail population, was roughly divided 50% white, 50% black. And so we got talking between cells and tanks about the conditions and what could be done about it. So it was, we decided to go on a food strike. And when the food was delivered in these little metal tins, we threw it all on the floor, refused to eat it, and the prisoners sort of like, by consensus, nominated me to be the spokesperson with the sheriff in his goon squad when, when they rolled in on us about what we wanted, what was this disruption about. So I, basically I had gone from like, doing support work for a strike involving black and white workers to supporting a, being involved in the strike of black and white prisoners. And and uh, so the sheriff tried to say that, you know, maybe maybe the demand for, for edible food was reasonable and that if if the prisoners went back to the cells, then he would he would change things the next day. So I told the prisoners, I brought that back to the prisoners, and they said, all right, we'll see what he's going to do. And the next day, the sheriff and his goon squad pulled me out of the cell and had me immediately transferred to the Tennessee State Penitentiary in Nashville. And before long, so I came into the prison system with a troublemaker jacket or label on me already. I was deemed as somebody who was stirring things up because of basic demands <laughs> rooted in human decency and health. And, um, and so as W.E.B. Du Bois, the great black scholar and activist, once put it, the big problem of the 20th century is the color line. And this is 1969 I'm talking about, and he was certainly right about that. In fact, he's right about it in 2018. But Nashville, the penitentiary at Nashville was like de facto segregation, dividing, you know, black and white prisoners. And I was, as somebody who quickly began to grasp the role of the prison system, and seeing so many black prisons, and, and also on death row, which where I ended up. I mean, I, I was doing a five-year marijuana sentence. They ended up putting me on death row. This was back in 1969-70 when the moratorium existed. It was ordered by the Supreme Court, which stopped executions at that time until they decided some cases. 
So they weren't actively executed, but they had a death row. There's people waiting to be executed. So I was, as a troublemaker, they had some extra empty cells on death row, and they put me in one of those cells. And so, uh, you know, one of my early experiences in the prison system was getting to know death row prisoners, their cases, how they ended up there, why so many of them were black, why they all came from the working class, whether it was the poor part of the working class or whether it was the blue collar part of the working class. There's, there's no wealthy people there. And um, so, and then um, by crossing that color line, and, and just one example is in the mess hall. They wanted all white prisoners to eat on one side and all black prisoners to eat on the other side. So uh, I immediately crossed that line. I sat at a table with some black prisoners that I knew, including from the county jail who had been sent there. And, you know, this caused an uproar. And um, without, not to make the story too long, so eventually, you know, they're, they're all over me. The administration classified me as a, they had the nerve, as I found out through paperwork later, of classifying me as a racial agitator. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I crossed that line. And uh, trying to politicize prisoners inside through smuggled uh, uh, newspapers and, and uh, you know broadsides that existed at that time. I was actually getting copies of the uh, Southern Student Organizing Committee paper in there, Southern Conference of Educational Fund paper, even the Black Panther paper, but it all had to be smuggled. And um, so they decided that to get me out of Nashville, which was a maximum security prison, and they sent me to Brushy Mountain Prison in, in the mountains of East Tennessee. And um, it was a horrible place, absolutely horrible. This is 1970-71 now. And this, this is a significant, you know, because your question is like, you know, how I became interested in prison organizing and being sent to Brushy Mountain was the end of the line. It was it was the severest punishment for somebody who was giving him trouble. You know, if somebody didn't step in the kind of lines that they drew. And in particular, uh, you know, for somebody who who was sort of like emphasizing common ground and cross-racial uh, cross unity, um, that was like the kiss of death. And Brushy was significant because I found myself a link in a very long chain that goes back many, many decades in this country to the birth of the penitentiary system. And in particular, as things evolved when after the Civil War, when chattel slavery was abolished, and they had the ruling class has to come up with a new way to control and repress, repress the black population. So in conjunction with Jim Crow laws and chain gangs, the Southern Penitentiary System is, is born. And a significant part of that penitentiary system was what was called the convict leasing system. I arrived at Brush in 1970. And only five years earlier, up until 1965, prisoners at Brushing Mountain were forced to work in coal mines right in the side of the mountain, right along, right along the back of the sides of the penitentiary. And it went back to the original convict leasing system, you know, part of the mechanism that replaced shadow, shadow slavery. Um, and the original prisoners at Brushy that, that, that 
mine coal were doing it, they were leased out to private corporations who were reaping enormous profits while these prisoners died in the mines. And they died, and a lot of them died, and a lot of them were mangled. And it took decades before some reform warden comes along and says, too many are dying. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the coal operation away from the corporations and have the state of Tennessee take it over. So it was like a flim-flam, you know, a bait and switch. So the state took it over, allegedly so that it would be less deaths and, and serious injuries. And they ran it for many years, and, and uh, up until 1965, up until five years before I got there. And uh, there were still too many deaths, too many injuries as time changed, and they decided to get out of the coal mining business, and they shut the mines down. By the time I arrived in 1970, I, I met convicts there who went back to the coal mining days. And so I'm straddling the two dimensions of, of this mass incarceration system in this country right at that juncture in 1970. In fact, you could make a case that I was a victim of the war on drugs, really. I mean, who goes to the prison for $7 worth of marijuana and ends up in a place like this? But Brushy's mission well, in 1970, while no longer in the coal mining business, they basically converted Brushy into what at that time could be called, what is now referred to as a supermax. Although it wasn't constructed that way, it was basically a lockdown prison. I mean, we're in our cells 23 hours a day at Brushy. There was only a very small minority of prisoners that worked to prepare food and stuff like that. Everybody else was locked in their cells, and it was usually three to a cell. They moved death row from Nashville to Brushy. The only media controversy I saw at the time there was um, what was supposed to be a, uh, of concern to the public, which was a high level of the mental illness among prisoners at Brushy, but not much of it came of it. So I, was, I saw, you know, Brushy became, five years after they stopped mining coal, sort of a flagship for the direction the U.S. prison system was moving in. And, and that was, you know, these lockdown supermax prisons where you're in your cell 23, 22 hours a day, where the death penalty, which came back again in 1976, becomes also a central feature of this school egg, although it doesn't exist in every state. Um, and if you fast forward to what I ended up in, uh, in this in, in much later in prisons like Marion and ADX, as technology involved and as mass incarceration expanded so that the system expanded to the point now where it's got about 2.4 million people locked up in this country, you get thousands of people on death row, and solitary confinement has become a management tool. So you have um, state-of-the-art supermax prisons now where they, from the ground up, they, can physic they physically design a prison for maximum isolation. So you, it's not just that you're in a cell 23 hours a day looking through open bars. I mean, there is all this, all this technology comes to bear on it. And it's expanded to the point where the estimates I see was 80,000 people on any given day of solitary confinement in this country. And almost every state, and certainly the feds, have supermax prisons. They have supermax prison here in Maine that we, we took on, you know, seven or eight years ago, some of the abuses that were going on there. Every state tried to cash in on it. And... Um, 
and underlying that is the fact that uh, you know when they see a prison population balloon to like 2.4 million, they realize you know the, the, the potential for trouble and disruption there, and so they took that preemptive move to start designing these supermax prisons. So, so in a sense. You know, that 1971, 1970 that I was at Brushy Mountain, I was really straddling two eras of mass incarceration in this country, and the growth of the gulag, uh, but it's a continuous flow when you see it. I mean, I, I amaze, sometimes I'm amazed that I'm old enough to have gone back that far, but it's important to recognize that it's a continuous link. This thing is... This mass incarceration system we have now in this country, it's, it's, it's by design. And it's been that way, at least going back to the end of the Civil War. So that, that propelled me into prison organizing, both inside and outside of prison. And I, uh, you know, when I left Tennessee and returned to the Northeast, initially I was doing a lot of stuff with Vietnam veterans against the war because the war was still going on. But eventually, I, I gravitated into uh, prison work, prison rights work, and that you know you're getting into the early '70s, and and if you look back at that time in the U.S., that was the height of the prison prison rights struggle in this country following Attica, the murder of George Jackson, and so many prison strikes. The early 70s was, sort of, was the high point for it. And as the war ended and I was looking for a, you know, something else to put my political energy into, the prison struggle was in the forefront. And that's, that was my next step. You mentioned before how it was interesting how these, these groups that you were involved with sort of broadened your understanding of the connection between different issues, as well as your personal experience. Having a mixture of anti-war and labor and anti-prison and definitely anti-racist struggle all mixed in there. I'd like to segue into maybe a little bit about, if you wouldn't mind talking about what the Sam Melville and Jonathan Jackson unit did. I know it was a very long period of time that it was in operation, but the scope of of focus that it had in creating solidarity actions with people struggling for liberation um, abroad and who were struggling against armaments training and sometimes actual troops of the United States repressing them and, and enforcing a new f form of colonialism. It really, it says a lot about, about the people that were involved in that group and later the UFF or later called the UFF. Can you Maybe briefly describe for listeners what what the group did and yeah the scope of his activities. Okay, the um, the, the scope of the activities. You know, we're target we're covering. We had two major multi defendant cases uh, involving SMJJ and UFF actions. Uh, one covered uh, the early 1980s, and uh, the larger case in which we were charged with sedition, along with RICO uh, violations, which is a racketeering statute, RICO, you know, designed to be used against organized crime, but in the 1980s they were using it against certain leftist political groups, including us. And if you look at sedition charges, if you look at sedition charges, how they've been used in this country going back to the 1700s, you know, but going going way back in U.S. history, you're going to find that 95% of the time sedition charges are used against leftists, some, you know, some group or individuals on the left of the political spectrum was the Communist Party or certain, certain anarchist groups or groups like the IWW, labor, Puerto Rican independence uh, activists. And 
that case covered 10 years of SMJJ UFS actions. So the political focus, it depends which part of that 10 years you're talking about. But, uh, and, I, and I'll just, you know, talking about the political focus of their actions, I'll limit the actions to basically a bombing campaign or campaigns that uh, UFF, SMJJ did, uh, and it began around prison conditions. Uh, there were strikes and activities at state prisons in Massachusetts in the mid-1970s. And so the first MJJ, the MJJ actions were around those prison conditions. The rest of the SMJJ actions had a focus on Puerto Rican independence and a release of Puerto Rican political prisoners that was still in the American Gulag at that time. Significantly, the last credited SMJJ action was an anti-apartheid action, I think, in 1978. Then, then the UFF actions picked up. And they were primarily focused there from the first credited UFF actions was an end to the apartheid system in South Africa, the release of Nelson Mandela and all political prisoners in South Africa. Uh, most of those actions targeted U.S. corporations like IBB, uh, IBM, sorry, and Union Carbide as an example. Uh, because as Mandela said at the time, the racist apartheid system in South Africa, the U.S. corporations involved in South Africa were the legs, were the economic legs on which apartheid walked. And uh, also one action targeted officers of the South African government that was located in New York City. The remainder of UFF actions, which continued up until 1984, when most of us, most of us were captured in 1984, uh, focused on the wars in Central America, particularly what was going on in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua at that time. Those actions took place in the early 1980s. You know, anybody who's around then, if you go back and look at it, you know, the United States was up to his eyes, up to its eyes in blood in Central America. I mean, it was just horrendous slaughter going on there. They've had truth and reconciliation commissions years later in El Salvador and Guatemala that, you know, have documented all this stuff, you know. All the massacres, all, you know, in Guatemala, they were saying, you know, insofar as the Guatemalan military would support the United States was targeting indigenous people, it was genocide. And then the U.S. was sponsoring, through the CIA, these, uh, you know, mercenaries, essentially, that from their refuge and their hideouts in Honduras were attacking the Sandinistas uh, in Nicaragua. But it wasn't mostly Sandin <laughs> it wasn't mostly Sandinista soldiers they were killing because they couldn't go up against them. They were killing mostly civilians. So that was that was the focus. Central America uh, in the early eighties. And you know, the SMJJ and UFF being underground for so long, just about a decade, you know, and we were charged with, in that second case, you know, these, these like, intricate conspiracy charges, sedition and, and, and RICO. They throw in, in addition to these political actions, uh, 
clear p- political actions because there's communiques issued with all of these, but also expropriations, which focus on banks, um, uh, because uh, of the role of expropriation in funding essentially an underground outlaw infrastructure. And, uh, you know, various weapons and explosive charges. And um, and there was a couple of exchanges of gunfire with the police. Interestingly, in that last case, there were eight of us charged. Eventually, eventually, when it came right down to the trial, the trial, the case lasted just over three years at an enormous expense. And when it came, when push came to shove, and we were actually in trial for the last year, meaning the jury had been selected and the trial had begun with witnesses, only three of us were left. And we were all either acquitted of the charges or the jury locked in favor of acquittal but could not reach a unanimous decision and the charges were dismissed. So the government lost the case, essentially. Um, I'd love to revisit a conversation later when uh, when Yan Laman is actually, when you all announce the public side of that, um, mm-hmm. if you're into it. Okay, cool. Yep. Uh, I've got your contact info. Yeah, it, it could be a big question. Um, I was going to ask about the, the resurgence of non-state white supremacist organizing. Is is that cool? Do you mind if we... It's a big question, but I don't have a long answer. Okay, so, that's great. <laughs> uh, so one last thing. In so, the last so, well, year's... Well, just just, just hmm. yeah. make it clear. What is the question? The resurgence uh, of uh, non-state white supremacist organizing. Yeah, so... I suppose resurgence is a good way to characterize it because it's always been there. Mm-hmm. But you haven't seen, like, large... in the, For at least a few years, you weren't seeing large demonstrations of of avowed open white supremacists taking space in the streets and trying to create, um, a, like, paramilitary movements that were trying to be mass movements, and you have recently, and I don't think that stuff's really come up and been visible around most of the country since the maybe the mid 90s and then before that during backlash against the civil rights movement i guess you had like the greensboro massacre in 1979 but it's not like a constant right yeah and then to, there, there, there was a resurgence late 70s uh into right into the early 80s and was a, and greensboro is one example of it of a resurgence of uh, yes uh clan and neo-nazi activity and they weren't calling themselves, and that's what they were calling themselves. They weren't calling themselves alt-right or, or Nazi light or whatever, you know what I mean? They, they were pretty blatant about it. And, and to the extent that, you know, there were, you know, Ku Klux Klan chapters popping up in New England, which is not usually, uh, you know, a hotbed for them, but, you know, we had had the big, racist busing clashes in Boston and that fuels part of it. And, um, but yeah, you're, I think you're right. Uh, you know, up until the time I was imprisoned in late 1984, you know, that was the, the last resurgence I was on the street for. And then I got out in 2004 and, um, um, you know, I've seen it. I've seen this resurgence take place since that time. I've been out. Jesus, I, I've been. I'll have been out about thirteen and a half years now. I saw a different kind of fear and anger when I when I first got out in two thousand four than I see now. And I think it is more blatant. It's, it's also it's also dressed differently. You know. So how do you do? You have any thoughts or feelings about how? Uh, anti-racists have been addressing it or approaching it or conflicting with it? Do you think that the models that people have been taking that you're aware of seem useful? Do they seem useful for um, you know, like intensifying and also spreading anti-racist movement building? Or do they seem insular? 
what what do you think i i i uh just a reminder right now i am sitting in a state that has an overwhelmingly white population in the very northeast corner of the of the country uh, i don't you know when you that that is a very big question like in this resurgence we we sort of recognize it i think most people do how whatever their perspective there's been a resurgence of this white racist uh, acti- activism activity and you know one of the things that the, 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 one of the ways obviously that faces change is because of the advance of technology using the internet and social media and all that stuff and i'm I'm pretty much I'm always semi-literate when it comes to computers, but even I see how people have taken it, how groups have taken advantage of that. We just we just had an incident here in Maine where, in Jackman, which is a very rural area of Maine, and it's a you know small town, they had a town manager, and as far as I know, I've been, I'm familiar with Jackson, I've been through it, but I don't live near it. I think it's a it's every citizen in that town is white. They had a town manager who they found out was had a Facebook page where he was posting white supremacist stuff and make, making white supremacist statements and talking about establishing a separatist white state, uh, possibly right here in Maine, since Maine has a very large white population. And to the credit of the citizens of the town of Jackman, they fired him. Unfortunately, they had to give him a severance pay, you know, of like $35,000 or something. But they got rid of him. They, they stood up. And heads like that have been popping up in Maine a little bit here and there. And I've been contacted by some people, oh, maybe we need to get, you know, get together and how do we deal with that? You know, if, if they start some of these white supremacists start looking at Maine like they, like they have in the past looked at the Northwest which has a large white population you know that Idaho Oregon area how to deal with it um, I mean usually when I've had to deal with it my personal experience is because it was right in my face you know as I you know told you about my experience with, you know, in prison, um, experience in, in, in trying to stand with white and black prisoners up to a sheriff and his goon squad. I mean, it's, it's like, it's, you know, that kind of intense thing. Uh, a lot of this white supremacist organization that's going on now is built on a softer profile. I mean, they're, you know, they, they obviously seem to be targeting campuses a lot. And uh, I can't stand to read this So I, I'm not going to spend hours on their Facebook pages looking at stuff. I look at just enough to really, you know, confirm certain things. But whether you're in Maine or North Carolina or Oregon or New York City or New Orleans or what, wherever you are, in determining how you're going to deal with a resurgence like this and whether that resurgence manifests itself on a campus, or whether it manifests itself through police brutality, targeting black or Latino people, for example, uh, so much is based on time, place, and conditions. I survived underground as long as I did because I kept that sort of rule of thumb in mind when I evaluated anything. And because it's a rule of thumb, time, place, and conditions, that, uh, you know, it's an essential part of, you know, developing a strategy, whether it's got a military route to it, as underground does, or uh, simply a, uh, or an activist route to it, uh, you know, like, Talking back to the early 1980s, the 
John Brown and anti Klan Committee. I knew people who were very active in that. In fact, I've seen somebody come up. I've seen it thrown out there. Should the anti, uh, the John Brown anti Klan Committee be be reformed? Um, because it went defunct at one point, and they 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 you know part of their agenda was to militantly confront the Ku Klux Klan and neo Nazis when they would hold these rallies or marches in the late seventies, early eighties. That's sort of what happened in Greensboro. So it's it's time, place, and conditions. It's it's, it's like we had an incident. We have something going on here with the. Uh, you know, there are several native tribes uh, with reservations in Maine. They're not large. They're relatively small. One of the tribes is Penobscots. Uh, and flowing right through this small reservation is, uh, or by it, is the Penobscot River. And it's, it's been an essential part of Penobscots' lives going back long before any white person stepped onto the land here in Maine. And now the state is looking to take, to, de, to legally strip the Penobscots. The Penobscots see themselves as stewards of the Penobscot River and the adjacent lands, and not the owners per se. But the state of Maine wants to strip them of any legal right to, de to determine anything about the Penobscot River and open the river up to commercial exploitation and, and, and the surrounding riverbanks as well, meaning they want to eventually see that river get polluted. And, of course, the Penobscots rely on that river for fish. And, you know, there's been several demonstrations around it. But I listened to what Penasca Elvis said to the, those of us who are activists who wanted to support the Penobscots in the struggle on the, the, uh, the waterway and land rights, but don't want to jump in front of them, don't want to do anything that's contradictory or disrespectful or subverts in some way what the Penobscots uh, need. And what those leaders have said is like, you know, and it, this was going back to a big rally when there was a lot of people showed up, the Penobscots it, it, on the river. Uh, the Penobscot leaders were saying, we need you to support us. When we issue a call, when we, when we have a gathering and we, we ask for support, that's what we want. We want you there. We don't want you developing our agenda for us or anything like that. We want you to support. So, like, if you're talking about white, white anti-racist activism, uh, that's part of it. Depending on, on who you're struggling with and, and trying to support, uh, You've got to consider and acknowledge the role of Black, Latino, Indigenous people and what what they want. What are they saying about how to deal with police brutality in New York City or on uh, you know the University of Virginia campus on how to deal with uh, white supremacist organizing? Um, that has to be considered. If you if you don't have that as part of your thinking, then you're gonna f up. You're gonna do or say something that's gonna be uh, counterproductive to what the people that are most affected by the white supremacy want and need. So time, place, and conditions. I can't t I I can't make a recommendation on what somebody in Houston, Texas, or Milwaukee, Wisconsin is going to do, not from here, not, 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 not from having been in Milwaukee or Houston, actually ever in my life. That makes a lot of sense, and I appreciate the, the thoughtful response. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat, and yeah, I wish you health and wellness. 
Thank you, brother, and uh, thank you, listeners. Uh, I wasn't even aware of this this radio programming until... Uh, it's Daniel probably got you in touch, right? Daniel McGowan, who, I, who I've done worked on uh, several things with, who I've, I've found to be a very committed, capable young brother. Glad to know him. And uh, I'll, I'm going to... Uh, you sent me the link, and I will uh, check out what you come up with for a broadcast on this, and I'll check out your other programming. And as you indicated, maybe as we get farther down the road a little bit on on um, Jan's uh, parole effort, uh, maybe we can do a, a you know, small update on that of some sort. Yeah. I love that. Um, that's that's the kind of thing that we really like to have on the show. We like to talk to to people who are writing radical left and anarchist things, or or getting updates about the struggles or projects in different places. But also, uh, it's really important to us to to have voices, both voices of experience, um, and also to to have updates on the people that are behind bars still. It's great. I love the anarchists. <laughs> I, I'm sure I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a Marxist than an anarchist, but I love anarchists. And, and uh, when I was in the isolation cell of Tennessee State Prison many years ago, I had anarchists to keep me company. One was Paco <laughs> and one was Stan Zetti, Yeah. as an example. And they had such an impact on me as I was reading history to try and get a better handle on how the system operates. And uh, I brought Sarkin and Van Zetti up in my opening mm-hmm. statement in sedition trial. I represented myself, so I could always do all my own statements and stuff. And how one of the ways I survived that freaking war zone, and that's what some of those prisons are like. They're like war zones. But so much isolation was the company of the people like Sarkin Van Zetti. Yeah, the trial statements that you wrote were brilliant, and it's not it's not surprising that they get brought up so frequently when in interviews with you. Um, I'm definitely going to try to point listeners back to it because you cover so much, and it's so candid and, and personal, you know? Yeah. Thank you. To find past episodes of The Final Straw, you can subscribe to us in your favorite podcatching device or visit the website thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org for eight years of free audio if you'd like to hear us on your local radio airwaves contact your community radio station and tell them to check out the radio tab on our website or you can reach us via the final straw radio at riseup.net and we'll try to help in the process we are up on the most obnoxious social media platforms and can easily be shared after we air if you appreciate this podcast and the voices that we bring to you each and every week, at least once a week, please consider a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal or LibraPay. You can also subscribe to recurring donations for us at patreon.com TFSR and get some pretty sweet swag. If you want one of the shirts or mixtapes or sticker and button packs that we offer to Patreon customers but can't afford a monthly donation, drop us an email and we'll try to work something out. You can find out more about ways to donate to The Final Straw Radio at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org slash donate. Now we're going to close out with a track by Graham Johns off of the album We Might Look Like People For Now. This is the song State Order. It's dour and pretty and can be found on bandcamp.com.
showers from those cold, cold blue machines. The police chief gave his statement, and it pleased the bourgeoisie. Nazis march in the 